radio frequency spectrum that is used to understand the RF energy that is transmitted into the air. This is owned, this spectrum, from um, household electricity to the areas of the frequency spectrum where we actually transmit like AM radios, FM radios, television, microwave ovens. All of this spectrum, the, the rights to transmit RF energy into the air is owned by the U.S. government. They actually bid sections of this spectrum to companies. Uh, recently, AT&T, Verizon, and Google were on an auction for the 700 megahertz spectrum and AT&T put in a bid of over $9.4 billion for that spectrum. They don't own it, they just lease it for a period of time. So this is a very lucrative area, but the United States government owns most of it. There is an area that has been given to public use, and that is for the 802.11, 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. It's basically right around that area of the spectrum. That has been made free to the public. You don't have to have an FCC license to operate equipment. But this is a very closely guarded area of spectrum that you must get permission. You must have rights to. Generally, anything that transmits in the RF energy must, you must have government permission and you must be able to show an FC license, FCC license to operate the equipment and to repair the equipment. This is another view of that same spectrum. You can look at the various types of equipment and things that you would recognize, such as visible light, uh, fiber, telecom, uh, remote controls, the infrared on remote controls. So it gives you kind of a perspective of the equipment that you may be aware of and what spectrum that it uses. 802.11 again uses this area of the spectrum. That's the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz range. So let's look at the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. The 802.11b standard is there. The 802.11g standard is there. The 802.11n can operate in both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Many devices that have radios operate in this spectrum. It is one of those few areas of RF spectrum that is available to the public. Presently, it's one of the most used spectrum, and with the 802.11 BGN, there are 11 channels available to the United States. Some countries make this channel wider to the public. For example, in Europe, there's 13 available channels. So we're going to break down this graph, these pictures that we see right here. First of all, 802.11 G and N transmit 20 megahertz channels. So if you come over here, you can see when an access point fires up and is using channel 1, it takes up 20 megahertz of space in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. One of the problems is that if we want to run multiple access points in the same room or near proximity one to another, we have to move the next access point up to channel 6. Otherwise, there's inter-channel interference. This channel will actually interfere with channel 1. If we want to run three access points in near proximity or in the same room or in the same space, then we have to move the next access point to channel 11. So channel six, 1, 6, and 11 are very commonly used when access points are close together. Now below is the 802.11n. It allows the 802.11n access point to use 40 megahertz wide channels. Notice this jumps the data rate up to 150 megabits per second. But look how much space it uses. And so you, when you start using 40 megahertz wide channels and N in that space, you, you drastically reduce how many access points can be used. So let's think about this. Why do we have 11 channels in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, but normally use 1, 6, and 11? So I want you to pause and think about that question as we delve in looking at the various uh, concepts that are involved in that question. So this is a Google Earth map of a neighborhood. So let's learn a little bit from this. I'm going to first, let's say Joe has a house and he puts an access point. And let's say the blue circle represents the energy that comes out from the access point. And let's say there's about 115 feet between house to house. So there's a good deal of space 
between each home if they, every one of them had an access point. Let's say that Joe cho chose channel 2. There is no problem for his neighbor who decides to fire up their access point because they're so far apart, there's at least 115 feet between them, he could also use channel 2. The problem comes is when they're close. As long as they're in a neighborhood like this, which is some of the idea when they designed the 802.11 B, G, and N standards, was that people would be far further apart and there would be 11 channels available. So the guy across the street, he could use channel 2. Uh, with no problem because there's enough distance between the RF energy radiated out of this access point and this one that there really isn't going to be a problem of channel interference. So again, another neighbor could have channel 5 and then another neighbor could have channel 3. So in a neighborhood like this where access points are actually far away from each other, you can use all 11 channels or the same channel over and over. So there was plenty of room in the 2.4 as long as there's space between each access point, physical distance. So this is where we get into problem. Here we have a nice high-rise uh, condo. And let's say the guy on the 13th floor kicks off his access point. He's now radiating energy over 115 feet in all directions. So let's say he chose channel 1. And then the guy four floors down or three floors down, he's only probably 30 feet away and he decides to use channel 1. Now we have a problem. The 2.4 gigahertz does have a lot of problems when we have access points close together. So if another uh, person on, say, the above floor kicks on an access point and they use channel 1, then we're having a lot of inter-channel interaction uh, in, in this case, these three floors could use 1, 6, and 11. But, of course, we would have to talk to our neighbors and make sure that they don't use the channel we use. But what would happen when the fourth guy kicked on his access point? So when access points are close together in distance, this is where 2.4 really starts falling short. So here's another situation. Let's say I was contracted to set up wireless in this business office. And I set up my first access point, And they're all 802.11G radios. This would be pretty good. I'd have pretty good coverage for most of the users. And let's say I fired up another one. And I got coverage here. You can see as long as I deal with three radios, I have channels 1, 6, and 11. And there's enough distance between each of those channels that I'm not going to have inter-channel interference. But the minute I fire up the fourth radio to give this part of the office coverage, I'm in serious trouble. So this is some of the problems of the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. So the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum is really a crowded spectrum. It's got a lot of things going on. We've got things like Bluetooth. We've got radio control cars and airplanes and boats. We have microwave ovens. We have Zigbee which is a home wireless standard. We have Wi-Fi 802.11, BG and N. We also have 11 channels in that spectrum. So this is why we're moving to the 5 gigahertz spectrum. One of the things I want you to do is think about what are the disadvantages of wireless standards in the 2.4 gigahertz? And what are some of the advantages? The 5 gigahertz spectrum has been available to the public for some time. In fact, one of the first standards in wireless, 802.11a, was already in the 5 gigahertz spectrum. The problem was the design of radios was expensive. The standard never gained support from manufacturers simply due to high cost and was eventually replaced by better standards such as N and 802.11ac. 802.11n and AC both use the 5 gigahertz spectrum. Here's a good graph on it. You can see that uh, we can use both 40 megahertz wide channels, which is very good, 80 and even 160. In the US, the public spectrum is a little bit smaller than Europe, Japan, and India. So our, we have available 23 channels. In some areas of the world, they have 25, 26 channels. But we all agree on the major portions of these frequency areas for 802.11 N and AC. 
802.11ac is the first standard that is exclusively 5 gigahertz. So if you get an 802.11ac access point, it will not transmit in the 2.4 gigahertz range. In the United States, this area here is left blank because there are many weather radars that are still using this channel, this area of frequency spectrum. So this was not released to the public. And so your access points have to skip over this area and not use it due to many of the old weather radar systems. So what advantage do we have when we move to the 5 gigahertz spectrum? I want you to think about that question. So we can see right away, here we're looking at the 802.11n and AC standards. And we're looking at uh, the different options in transmitting 20 megahertz channels, 40 megahertz channels. In the AC standard, we're going to allow 80 megahertz channels and even 160. You can see that as you broaden the channel, instead of transmitting at 20, you transmit at 40 you get an almost double of your data rate. So one of the goals in the new AC standard is to widen the channel up to 160 megahertz wide, and we get a whopping 866.7 megabits per second. So there is significant advantage of widening the channels, but we reduce the available channels available. We reduce the amount of channels available for another access point close by. 802.11n, out of the box, the required standard is 40 megahertz wide channels, and generally 150 megabits per second is a typical single stream 40 megahertz wide channel transmission. AC will start at 80 megahertz wide channels, and with a single stream you should get 433 megabits per second. A question to think about, wide channels do improve data rate. We've seen that in our chart. But what are the disadvantages? I'd like you to think carefully about that question. So let's